Um, hi everyone, we're just gonna wait, I think a minute or two um, as usual, just to let a few more people join before we really get started. Um, but I'll start off by introducing EduVenture and Go to Co China. So EduVenture is um, a non-profit organization aimed at empowering young people to pursue careers with a positive social impact. Um, we've been running this series over summer to really encourage uh, lots of students to follow careers in sustainability, um, journalism, and then today we're going to be talking with Kaiser about some really interesting different paths working with China, which is going to be amazing. Um, Go to Co China, who we are working on these webinars in partner with, are an amazing TEFL internship opportunity where you can go and teach English in China for anything between two weeks to around two months. And I cannot recommend the experience enough. Um, I went last year, I did the maximum length of stay and it was absolutely incredible. Anna, our other host today, has also um, done some GoToCo programs, which were amazing. Um, and throughout this session today, there is a Q&A section at the bottom where you can submit questions on anything during the webinar that you would like to ask and we will leave time for those at the end. So just to quickly introduce myself, uh, my name is Isla, I am the EduVenture uh, Society President at the University of Exeter and I will be asking some of the initial sort of main careers questions at the beginning and then I'll be handing over to Anna. So Anna if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello everyone, so yeah my name is Anna, uh, I'll be running EduVenture at Bristol University um, and I'm also a sub-China ambassador at Bristol University. Um, so if anyone wants to get involved with either of us through two things, please contact us or contact me and we can get in touch. Um, I'll just briefly explain what sub-China does. So sub-China is one of the largest and most successful US-based media outlets for China-oriented cultural, political, technology and business news. Um, they have weekly newsletters, news articles, a vast array of things. And um, they also have the Seneca podcast, uh, which is centered around interviews with famous academics, policymakers, activists, a bunch of things, uh, which is hosted by Jeremy Goldcorn and Kaiser Kuo, who, which we have here, luckily. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So, um, Kaiser, it would be wonderful if you could please introduce yourself and what it is exactly that you currently do. I think you're muted, Kaiser. I just restarted my, um, my, my microphone app. Uh, oh, yeah, my name is Kaiser Guo and uh, I currently live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, I came back here about four years ago after 20 years living in China continuously. Uh, if you add it all up for my earliest days there, I think I probably spent about 22 years actually in China. Um, my um, current job is as editor at large for SubChina, uh, which we've just heard a little bit about from Anna. Uh, and uh, more importantly, my, my role there is as the host uh, of the Seneca podcast. I also uh, host an, another podcast called the Tyson Seneca Business Brief, and I produce the rest of the podcasts that are in our network. Uh, we currently have nine shows in the Seneca network, and uh, I'm in charge of, of basically all the audio content on, on the uh, entire China platform. That's absolutely amazing. I can't imagine producing all of those at the same time. So, well, it's not so yeah. bad. They're, they they come out every <laughs> other week for the most part, except for the two mm. of the shows. And so we we, we I, and I have fantastic help from Jason McRonald, who uh, is is an excellent sound producer engineer. Mm. So I think for a lot of students, we look at your career path and we think that's amazing. You've done so many different things. <laughs> But how do we even start the first step of getting close to the levels that you've attained? So what did you study at university? And then right. uh, when let, did let you me, start? Let, let me warn people off of my mm. particular career path. I mean, because it, it, it was so entirely haphazard. Uh, it was a China of a very different time. It was, I landed in a China that was sort of a low gravity planet uh, mm. where people with really middling skills 
could appear to be quite astonishing just because uh, China was just so underdeveloped at, at the time. Uh, do not assume that that is going to be the case <laughs> for, for, for you. Uh, that would be a very, very dangerous assumption to make. Um, my, to, 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 to trace it, again, it's extraordinarily haphazard, but uh, I started off with, yeah, a very clear intention of, of doing something related to China. And that's because I took a trip there when I was only 15. It was in 1981, and um, you know it was a family trip there. And you know, of course, I was just astonished at how underdeveloped it was, just how how completely uh, you know backward it was in so many ways, so profoundly so. Um, and I, yeah, I was distracted by the woman walking by in a towel. No, it wasn't a towel. But <laughs> Sorry, I, that's okay. Uh, my. Um, uh, second trip there was in 1986, though, and just in that five-year period, uh, the the level of change that had taken place was so profound, so conspicuous, and just so just absolutely astonishing to me that I realized then and there that I really wanted to sort of hitch my wagon to that, uh, as it were. I re I recognized that this is going to be probably the most important story for the rest of my life, and I want a front row seat to it. So from that point on, I mean, when I came back to university in 1986, this was after my second year, uh, and I refocused my study, uh, my area of study. I had been working mainly on uh, sort of Soviet and Eastern European politics, uh, which in 1986 still seemed like a sensible thing to do. But uh, I, I really, I refocused entirely onto China and ended up taking as many courses on contemporary Chinese politics, on Chinese history, as I could, you know, stack on. And that was a really good thing. I also started to burnish my Chinese, which had fallen by the wayside since my youth. I had grown up speaking, you know, a smattering of household Chinese, uh, but I started to, to try to get that in better shape. Uh, and, you know, a lot of this was because just by pure coincidence in 1986, my band in college was invited to go to China to play the following summer in 1987. And I was frantically trying to get that together uh, so that we could, we could actually make that trip. It didn't end up happening. That was a profound disappointment with me, but sometimes, you know, out of disappointment, you can find inspiration. And I was, it just made me burn with this crazed passion to get to China with a guitar, to find those rock musicians that I suspected were there uh, to, to uh, hook up with them and to start, making rock in China. Um, and so as soon as I graduated, that's what I did. I headed to China on the pretense of going there to study. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I knew what I was really there to do. That's so cool. So when you got to China, how did you get into the professional music industry? So it wasn't professional by any stretch of the imagination. I, I, initially, <laughs> I mean, it was just a bunch of people who were I mean, it couldn't have been professional if they, if they wanted it to be because it was, I mean, there was, there was one person who had, who was probably making a decent living actually as a rock musician. Everyone mm -hmm. else was just sort of scraping by, you know, still living off their parents or, or, or whatever, living off, you know, the occasional anthropology student who would come through, who was, you know, doing an ethnographic study of the emerging Beijing rock scene. You could, you know, oh, hey, great. <laughs> I, I see that I'm going to, yeah. Anyway, it was, um. It wasn't anything close to professional, uh, but I, I, it was, again, just by, by luck, I, I uh, found the right people who could make the right introductions. Um, mm. I, I really, honestly, just l walked into a, a music store uh, with, with an American friend of mine one afternoon after class, and uh, just this chain of events just sort of unfolded that uh, ended in that afternoon, that later that evening, uh, getting just riotously drunk with a, a guy who I would co-found uh, a band with the, the following year. Um, so yeah, again, it was just not good career advice, but uh, I, think, I think by way of career advice, so far what we can glean from my, my story is uh, passion is important uh, and, and having a really, you know, sort of clear sense of mission. Also just, you know, sort of daring to put yourself out there uh, to, to, to you know, put yourself, take yourself right out of your comfort zone and, and into something. I mean, you really test yourself. You, you learn quite a bit about what your own limitations are and, and what your capabilities are when you do that. And I, I recommend that, that people do that. The other thing is just having um, 
for me, it was, I, I only learned this really later on I, when I look back after having had one job that was just thoroughly miserable that I felt mm -hmm. you know, completely wrong for, uh, I realized what was different about that compared to the other uh, uh, career, you know, steps that I've had along the way where I was really happy. And I realized that it was because I had gone off mission. So what was my mission? I, I didn't re realize it at the time, but subconsciously, I have always been kind of mission driven. I always wanted to build sort of bridges uh, between in, in bi-directional ones between China and the United States. I was very lucky. Not everyone has this sort of same good fortune, but I was born into a family and in the circumstances where it was the, the most natural thing in the world for me to be able to claim these two civilizational inheritances as my own. I could claim this Western civilizational inheritance that goes back to, you know, to, to classical Greece or, or, you know, further back still, if you, if you care. Uh, and it felt entirely natural that I, I saw myself as a product of, of Western civilization. At the same time, it felt entirely natural, not, not artificial at all, for me to claim inheritance from the Chinese civilization and mm -hmm. to feel pride in both of them. And being somebody who could do that naturally, I always wanted to connect them. I wanted to make them whole within me. Uh, not to sound too new agey or anything, but it really mm -hmm. did feel like, you know, I wanted to maybe resolve these two things in, in uh, my own person. I lived until a few years ago in a time where that was possible, where it was a rare thing for me to feel sort of torn in, in two separate directions. I felt like sometimes, yeah, it was three steps forward and two steps back, but the general direction was toward convergence. And that was very deeply satisfying. I may have emo emotionally and intellectually invested too much in that idea, uh, which is why I'm just, you know, suffering kind of low grade depression <laughs> now watching the US China relationship blow up and yeah. completely go to shit. Yeah. So obviously then those relationships that we talked about became very, very important to you and you really wanted to try and find connection between the two cultures. So experiencing that in China and then convert going from music, which is such an amazing creative sector into editing how did you make the transition between such quite different, I would argue, sectors? What advice yeah. would you give? I, I get transition? asked that question a lot. I don't think it's that mm. unusual. For, I mean, so first of all, I, I never had thought of music as something that I was really doing professionally. I mm. kind of always in the back of my head knew that I wasn't that good. That I wasn't, <laughs> you know, I wasn't one of the, some guitar god. I wasn't, I mean, I, I was somebody with really kind of stubbornly mediocre skills. I mean, that, that were not amenable to improvement. I think I, I have kind of short, stumpy fingers and they don't move that fast. I just, I'm not that good. Um, so I kind of knew that I always had to have something else on another burner going. I need to have another iron in the fire. Um, and that, uh, I mean, I had, I had gone to school after, after uh, starting the band. I had come back after 1989, after you know, the Tiananmen incident was so brutally su suppressed after the, the massacre of June 4th. I came back to uh, the United States and didn't have much else to do but start graduate school earlier than I had originally planned to. I wanted to stay in China for at least another year before I started graduate school. I brought all my GRE prep materials with me to China and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. I ended up just advancing my plans and starting grad school. Fortunately, there was a really good China program in my hometown, Tucson, Arizona, at the University of Arizona. And there was one scholar who I really wanted to work with in particular, uh, and he really took me under his wing, really mentored me. He was kind of the doyen of American studies of, 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 of Chinese foreign policy, which was something I was interested in. Um, it turns out I was really more interested in, in Chinese intellectual history. And, and there was a lot of resources there for, for, for that as well. So um, I, was, I was, you know, I always knew that I could fall back on something related to my mm -hmm. academic work. Now, what had that done? That had trained me as a writer. I, I, I was able to write, uh, to, to read with comprehension and to, you know, remember a lot to synthesize and to write pretty effectively. And I never really wrote in a, in a densely academic style. I was, I, I was capable of doing that, but I always liked to write for, for sort of broader audiences. And so I was pretty confident about my ability to write. And so, uh, 
when I left the band. So after, okay, just quickly in 96, I, I, I left graduate school uh, for sort of heavy metal recidivism. I fell back into, um, you know, I went back to China to, to rejoin Tang Dynasty. Um, I did that re reluctantly, honestly, I can say I did it reluctantly because right? I was getting close to finishing. I had already finished my quals. I was taking my prelims. I was ready to start writing my dissertation. Um, but, you know, we had uh, a, a, the bass player of our band in May of 1995 had been killed in a motorcycle accident. And uh, I was sort of watching as the band was falling apart, something that I had, you know, really invested in, uh, you know, significantly. It's probably the greatest thing I had ever done to date. Uh, so the lead singer asked me to come back and rejoin as lead guitar player of the band. And they kicked out the lead guitarist who he couldn't get along with and who was only sort of the two of them were only kept from each other's throats by that bass player who had now died. So um, that, that, that didn't last as long as I, would, I hoped it would. It, it only went for a few years. I, and, and in 99, I saw the writing on the wall. I knew that my days were really numbered in the band. And that's the story, you know, I can't really, get into in too much detail. It's been told before, but um, when I left, I had to really take stock and figure out what the hell am I going, going to do? Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is not something I would recommend because most people can't sort of will into existence uh, the job of their dreams. And I somehow was able to do that um, in, in the course of, I think like 10 hours. I sat there just sort of oh, what am I gonna do? You know, with my computer open, I opened my laptop and I was writing, um, I, I seriously took inventory. I said, okay, so I could go back to the States and finish my degree. I could start another band. I could maybe try to write a book. I could write some fiction. I, I like writing. But hey, you know what? There is a lot of uh, venture capital money sloshing around here. Everyone is starting internet companies. A lot of them are, are aspiring to be bilingual. A lot of them would want somebody like me to go work for, for them. You know what? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to you know, see if I can find a job at an internet company. And I closed my laptop and went to bed. And the next morning I went downstairs and had some scrambled eggs and then came upstairs and the phone rang. And it was, what do you know? It was a guy who was investing in, he was a, he was the bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal in, in, in Shanghai at the time. Uh, but he had, he was the guy who made some investments on the side and he had invested in an in internet startup called chinanow.com. And they were looking for an English editor in chief. And he says, I know you play in this band. Oh, I don't. But would you consider? Yes, I would. And um, so the very next week, I was hired uh, as editor in chief of this internet site that was, you know, basically covering, you know, culture and, and society and, uh, you know, events. It was sort of like an expat magazine that you'd find in China, you know, that's Beijing or, or the Beijinger, uh, but in online form. And so immediately I just dove into doing that. And now, so that did two things. That, that set me up, first of all, to, to do editorial stuff. But secondly, I was in this crowd of people who were you know, doing the internet. And so I didn't know a damn thing about internet technology, but I was surrounded by, I didn't know anything about the language of venture capital or anything like that. But um, just in that peer group, I, I, I absorbed a lot of it. And the next thing I knew, I had, you know, Jack Ma and, and Charles Strong and all these founders of companies uh, who I was, you know, frequently seeing at conferences, having dinner with, had them on speed dial on my phone. And so from there, after China Now went under in 2002, it was pretty easy to transition into, so I had editorial and contacts with the tech industry, uh, an industry that everyone was really keen on, on reading about, to becoming a technology reporter, which is where the, the next step went. So serendipity entirely. So obviously you've talked about how you were very lucky to be to a degree in the right place, right time, yeah. but also the fact that you had that network that really allowed you to then transition between sectors and different roles. What advice would you give for young people trying to build a network, professional network in China um, yeah. now? I think, I think it's, uh, it's such a hard thing to give advice on because so much of it just has to do with your personality, uh, how you push yourself out there. You know, don't be, don't be an asshole. 
Don't be a <laughs> dick. Don't, don't be a douchebag. Don't be pretentious. Don't be all knowing. Be humble. Be modest. Don't be overly modest. Don't sell mm-hmm. yourself short. But you have to find that sweet spot where, you know, you seem earnest, but not sort of like an eager beaver. Don't be off putting in your earnest, earnestness. Don't, you know, ask everyone you meet to be your mentor. I mean, that, that's, I, I get a whole ton of that all the time. A lot of people who, you know, it was before COVID-19, of course, who, everyone wants to have coffee with you to talk about their career and what, what they can do. And some of them are charming and wonderful and they know exactly how to do, do it. And others are just so off-putting, are, are so, you know, sort of clingy or needy or demanding or, or, uh, or you know, have, have such sort of transparent motive uh, that it's, mm-hmm. it, to me at least, extremely off-putting. So you, you need to, to really calibrate that correctly. Um, don't be an, you know, an eager over networker. You seem insincere. Um, I think that the best thing to do is just be you know, quite natural about it. I mean, all the connections that you end up making, I mean, the best ones are just um, you know, people you meet at parties and really click well with. People you meet at a bar and you're just drinking with. Uh, I mean, People who you can have long conversations with about literature or or about uh, politics or, or or other things that aren't about you know your immediate career goals and needs. Mm. You need to show people the human side of you. Mm. I think that's a really really good advice. Thank you. So after you worked at ChinaNow.com and then you transitioned through quite a few different roles, you worked at Baidu, you worked. Um, and now you're obviously running the podcast. Right. What skills do you think were the most useful that you've learned over the past sort of five to 10 years that have really yeah. helped you with gaining the podcast role? Because that's a really, I guess, amazing presenting role. Yeah, well, I think that, that it wasn't so much that I learned skills to do uh, that. I mean, nobody thought of podcasting as a career, you know, uh, when I was starting off in my career you know, podcasts have only really been a thing for, you know, maybe a dozen years at, at the most. Uh, I think that it's, when Jeremy Goldhorn and I started the podcast, uh, we recognized in each other two things. One is that we, we both had networks. Uh, we both had sort of, sort of broad knowledge about the topic areas that we were going to talk about. Both of us are pretty conversant in everything from economics to sort of the sociology of China, to China's history, to China's elite politics, to China's foreign policy. And we were before we sat down to, to do the podcast in the first place. Um, but the most important thing is that we had, we had uh, really rich networks of, of diverse people and we were talkers. We were both people who were comfortable talking before audiences, talking into a microphone. We weren't big ummers and ours. We didn't stammer. We were talkers. And that was a, a skill that neither of us had ever deliberately trained. Neither of us were in Toastmasters or debate team or anything like that. We were just people who were pretty sociable and uh, really lo- enjoyed conversation. Mm. I think that's, um, so that's that's with the podcast but the real skill though is writing right mm. i mean and, and uh, there's there's a, a skill too in in presenting which i guess I, I kind of did learn later on and that is i mean nobody has all of that information at their command and memorized you cannot do a couple of shows every week the way that we do and have all of that data just you know at your command without looking at a, a script so it's scripted, but it has to not sound ever like it's scripted. So there is that skill that you have to learn of being able to talk as though extemporaneously while actually making reference to a script. Uh, that's not easy. Yeah, that, that's really amazing. That's definitely not easy. No, but, but it can be learned. That can be learned. Mm. And uh, I, I've, some of our other podcast hosts, when they've started off, they, you know, um, they, they do sound like they are reading right off of a script. And I've told them ways that they can wean themselves off of that and so, sound more natural. Uh, and that took a, a, a few efforts sometimes, uh, 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 you know, and send it back and say, sorry, not going to air this one. It really sounds robotic. Uh, but eventually they all sort of got the hang of it. Now it's second nature to them. But also writing for script. That is not an easy thing either. If most of the time, if you take, 
the sort of an essay you would write if you wrote an op-ed piece or if you, you wrote an article and you read it straight, even in your best sort of stentorian acting voice, trying to make it sound as casual as possible, it wouldn't mm -hmm. sound plausible. So writing for, for speaking is, is a, a different talent. Uh, and I, I have dev devised this sort of methodology I call the beef method. If you have a piece of, of beef, a, a nice cut of steak or something, mm -hmm. uh, it, you can either sear it quickly on two sides for a minute and a half on each side over uh, basting it in butter, and it'll taste delicious. Very, very quick. Or you can you know, ch chop it up and put it in a slow cooking pot and cook it for hours and hours until it falls apart. It's delicious. But anything in between that, and it's going to be inedible. So either work that script over and over again until you really, it really does sound authentically like it's been written spontaneously, or just write it spontaneously is the first thing that comes out. You can write it really quickly. So take 15 minutes with it or take three hours with it. Don't take 45 minutes with it. Oh, okay. That's really good advice. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So thank Kaiser's you. Kaiser's beef method. <laughs> Kaiser's beef method. <laughs> Love it. So I'm going to hand over to Anna now to ask some slightly more China specific questions. Okay, great. Hey, thanks. As well. Thank you so much for that. That was very, very interesting. Um, so I guess one of the most intriguing aspects of what you're talking about in, with the China related aspect of it is probably like you mentioned that you're claiming these two civilization inheritance. How does that manage with when you're handling a two cultural work? So yeah, that's a great question. So I think that, that, that what it gives you more than anything else is empathy, is an instinctive empathy. And I, I, people who listen to my show know that I bang on about this an awful lot. But um, there are two different kinds of empathy, right? There is that emotional empathy that we all feel like, you know, if Anna, you told me that your grandmother had just died, I don't need to know anything about your relationship with your grandmother to have a very good sense of how torn up you must feel about, you know, how bad you, you must feel. And I would, you know, unless I were a psychopath uh, or, or way down the, 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 the autism scale, I would certainly know uh, how to feel. I would know how you feel. I can't know that when it comes to, you know, complex issues, like understanding how uh, people from another country process their experiences. I don't know, if I don't know about their history, if I don't know about uh, their lived experience, if I don't know about the values, the beliefs, the habits of mind that inform their thinking, I can't put myself into their shoes as much as I'd like to. That kind is called cognitive empathy. I like to call it informed empathy. It's an easier word. Uh, but informed empathy doesn't come naturally to people. It, it, it's something that actually takes work. And um, what I feel like that, that dual civilizational inheritance has done for me is it made me not have to do as much of that work. I mean, I had it sort of handed to me. I, I was, I've been around people uh, of both, and I, I do know how they feel. I do know how they, they process experience. Uh, I, I know how, for example, now, China responds, for example, when the United States, uh, you know, issues some new policy in this ridiculous full court press that, that's been going on all summer, or and, and before. So I, I think it's it's um, yeah, it's it's all about empathy for me. Great, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, but what recommendations would you give to someone for that hasn't had that experience that's coming sure. directly just from a specific culture but that's, wants that's to a, expand somewhere that, else that's a great question i think it's it's one of, of of one of the things that i think is is just absolutely vital for anyone who's starting off and who wants a career that's related to china who wants to be uh, a quote-unquote china watcher um, <laughs> is develop that cognitive empathy and that requires a lot of reading i mean it requires a lot of talking to people it requires a lot of legwork um, you, you actually, you know, go and live there. You have to, you, you have to um, read uh, the same things that inform their worldview, not read about their worldview, but you need to, to almost sort of experience the formation of that worldview at first hand in order to, to do that. And that's, that's not, not easy. And uh, I see there's a, there's a question about, you know, um, 
I, I saw in, in chat, somebody had asked about the importance of language. Of course, language is really vital to that. Um, you know, I, I, am, I don't know how scientific this is, but I, I am somebody who really believes that um, language actually shapes um, the way people think. That it's not something that it's, it's actually uniform across all languages. This, the differences may be subtle; they may not be all that pronounced. They may often be, you know, overstated by by some people, you know, who are, you know, of the essentialist type. But but I think that it does make a difference, and learning Chinese really does uh, make a difference because you learn a whole new set of metaphors, or a whole new set of the sort of analogical uh, reference that that people use to shape language. Uh, and it's super important to be able to do that. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. I I agree with that as well. I'm I'm currently learning Mandarin, yeah. so it's a it's a difficult process, <laughs> it is but amazing. it's yeah. very interesting. And um, would you would you say that for someone that's starting off, wanting to go into China, do they need all of this information, all these maybe China specific skills? before that or do you think it can be worked no. on once the person arrives there you learn it along the way i think that you know getting yourself there it actually uh, i mean th these days of course that's very difficult but um, hopefully in, in this notional post-covid world uh we'll be able to do that again getting yourself there i mean it, it, it actually knocks off a lot of the things that you, you suddenly place yourself in this environment in which you will be immersed in the language uh I, I can't even imagine having undertaken the study of Chinese without having, you know, lived in China. It would have been impossible for me. Um, you know, it will develop that that empathy. It will give you an appreciation, I think, uh, for history and for for, for Chinese history. Um, also, I think, um, you know, I, I really emphasize this a lot. You've got to know your own history. You've got to, you know, all history. The endeavor of historical study is inherently comparative. You can't just study, uh, you know, Chinese history in isolation. Uh, the, the the danger in doing that is you 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 don't end up with an appreciation for the utter contingencies of history if you if you lack knowledge of your own. Um, too often we here in 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 the Anglophone West sort of believe ourselves to be uh, at this sort of historical endpoint. We have this kind of whiggish teleological belief in how history works and oh yeah of course it was inevitable that this was it was going to be like this and what's wrong with you laggards over there why don't you just come over across this historical chasm and come over to where we are you know where we have you know these advanced institutions and 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 uh rule of law and all these wonderful things um if you don't study history, you don't have an appreciation for the enormous gravitational pull that it exerts. And you don't have an appreciation for how difficult it is to kind of achieve escape velocity from history. Uh, and once you do, and you start thinking about things like, you know what, when reform and opening began in China, just 40 years ago, uh, somebody who was starting their first job there, who's, you know, the age of some of the people on this call, uh, they're still working today. This has been not even one biological lifetime. And so the expectation that we have of how much can change is recalibrated. People, I think right now, often have too um, sunny uh, an idea of how fast a whole society can transform its entire way of thinking, how, of how fast it can escape from the gravity of history. I think that spending time there will teach you that it is not as, as, as easy as maybe we sometimes imagine it to be. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And um, with these expectations of how much can change, then regarding the current China affairs with the cancellations of Fulbright scholarships and, and Peace Corps, how do you new expectation of change uh, regarding specifically you know the future for the movement between students between these countries and all of that is it is it can it will it change fast is it going to be a i mean it's, it's so I, I can't even tell you how dreadful i think all of this is it's just been so hurtful um i mean and it, it's just you know it begets kind of you know a, a reciprocal 
hurt too. I mean, it, it's why, why on earth would we want to blind ourselves right now? Even if we do accept that China is going to be a really important strategic competitor to us, I don't like that framing of it, but uh, even if we do accept that, that, why on earth would we want to, to you know, cut off our nose or our ears or bl blind ourselves, which is exactly what we're doing by, you know, uh, canceling things like the Peace Corps, you know, you think about the Peace Corps. I mean, we we're here to talk about careers. So many of the great, the great uh, people who've, who are writing about China today, who have, or thinking about China today, who are making policy in China today, who are, uh, you know, doing things out there that have to do with China, are veterans of the Peace Corps. Um, probably the best known is Peter Hessler, uh, who is just far and away my favorite writer in the English language on China. He has just such sensitivity, humor, but also uh, just delicious prose, right? His writing is fantastic, but he is, he was a, a two-year uh, Peace Corps volunteer in, in Fuling, in, in uh, what's now in, in Chongqing, but he uh, wasn't alone. Michael Meyer, who wrote oh, books like, um, uh, you know, The Last Days of Old Beijing, and has written a trilogy of books about a little town in Manchuria where he lived, uh, uh, Rob Schmitz, who is an NPR correspondent and who was in Shanghai for a very long time. He was part of the Peace Corps. Uh, David Wertheim, now, who runs uh, Politico, the, the, the online magazine Politico's whole China section. He was a Peace Corps volunteer. And then the list goes on. There are so very many of them. Uh, and these are some of the most sensitive and, and, and knowledgeable people on China. Uh, it's just just tragic. Fulbright scholars, it's probably even a longer list. How, I mean, uh, uh, it, these are people who, who provide invaluable uh, intelligence and, and understanding to, uh, of, of what's happening in China. So, I mean, the Trump administration is just so, I mean, I, I, I don't have anything kind to say, but this is about the worst thing that they've done. Uh, so it's, it's tragic. And, you know, the, the worst thing is that they've really tried to scorch the earth right now. And, and in this last month with near daily, you know, offenses against the decency, uh, trying to just burn everything down, every last bridge, uh, to make it impossible for an incoming Biden administration, and that looks even more, more likely every day, an incoming Biden-Harris administration to uh, reverse any of this, to, to actually you know, uh, pull back or to, you know, God forbid they would ever use the word to reset China relations. It's, it's going to be even harder now than it was already going to be. So it's really tragic. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, I don't think that's, that's the end because, you know, we do still have the ability to talk to Chinese people daily online. Thank God. I mean, although, you know, even those bridges are being burned with this threat of, the, uh, of, of banning WeChat. Uh, but so I, I, would, I would urge people to, to make sure to have those connections uh, and to, to cherish them, to really, you know, uh, even while we can't be in China, to, you know, to have conversations, to set up Zoom calls uh, with your Chinese friends and, and to understand their perspectives better. Yeah, thank you. It, it is very tragic. And as you said, we'll see and hopefully there's a more positive outcome than what we can hope for. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned that why blind ourselves? I think that's very interesting. How, how do, would you say we can keep then our eyes open? How, how do we avoid it? How can we still go out there, go to China? Um, do you, how, do we, how do students still get that yeah. opportunity it's going to be harder i mean there are going to be less um you know obvious available avenues for, for being able to do that uh they just need to redouble their efforts and you know if there's a silver lining to to it it'll mean that the ones who are most passionate about it and most interested in and most willing to sacrifice to, to do it will be the ones who eventually are able to um i i think that's that's hardly a silver lining i mean i would i think that the more the better um uh, in, in this case, I, I mean, I, I think that, that, um, you know, 99% of people who end up spending significant amounts of time in China are made better for it. 
Um, you know, there is that one percent who become really, you know, embittered and and angry fuckers, but um, we'll ignore them for now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's it, it's harder, but again, online, you know, online is 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 possible. Um, and then, of course, keep up in the news. It's really important to do that. Uh, and and read a, a broad diet of news. Don't just read, you know, the mainstream U.S. media. Don't just read Chinese state media. Uh, you, you need to read and read critically. Uh, be critical of, of of both perspectives because the everyone has an agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. For sure. You can start with sub China. I mean, subscribe to sub China. <laughs> exactly. That is yeah. a very good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um. So you mentioned online a lot. As someone who's starting out in the, in the journalism kind of area, mm-hmm. to what extent would you say the censorship and general restrictions in the media and on the internet affects an individual who, who wants to write about topics in general that are, you know, in general, or maybe that are slightly more taboo or yeah, you know, I, I be restricted? Think that- yeah, I mean, the, the, it's it's something that everyone is going to encounter from one side or the other. Um, writing about it in English uh, here in the United States, of uh, there's there's no Im, you know immediate danger uh, to you unless you plan on if you if you do go to China. You know, there's a lot of worry right now about the new Hong Kong national security law and uh, whether it has some kind of or whether China, Beijing believes it to have some kind of extrajudicial uh, jurisdiction. Uh, extraterritorial ju- uh, jurisdiction, and um, th- th- there are a lot of you know good legal scholars who've made the argument that yes, indeed, that's how we have to to interpret it, and why we do have to be careful. But I, I think that um, you know we we can't be timid about that stuff. I mean, we we have to be you know balanced, and nuanced, but we can't uh, we sh- we mustn't just self censor. Uh, we you have to be you know bold, but neither should we overestimate or should we sort of overcompensate for that by focusing only on the sorts of topics that Beijing would rather we not be, be talking about. And there are people who do that as well. Uh, I think that uh, you just have to sort of, you know, be intellectually honest, uh, write about the things that you're interested in because you're interested in them, not because Beijing says you shouldn't be or because Beijing says you should be. Uh, you know, be intellectually honest and intellectually independent uh, but it is tough. I think, um, let me, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, you're going to face, you know, uh, a lack of availability of information, uh, as spotty VPNs when you're in China and when you're outside of China, uh, you're going to have, look, look, you know, I don't believe that, that the U S or, or the, the UK media, uh, is setting out to disparage China uh, I think that we have to understand that there are structural uh, elements in the way that Anglophone journalism is done that will predispose it. First of all, I mean, they'll, they'll write mostly what are negative stories. They do that about their own countries as well. Uh, our, our journalistic traditions are adversarial and they always, they have been, and that's actually held us in very good stead, especially now in this, this time of, of, of Donald Trump. I mean, I, we, we, I hope that we all applaud the way that journalism has very boldly challenged power. But, you know, we have to stop and ask ourselves, does this transfer? Can we take this and use the exact same approach when we write about uh, foreign countries? Because while I can pick up the Guardian, in, in, you know, if I'm sitting in London, I pick up the Guardian and I read it cover to cover. And there are going to be an awful lot of very, very negative stories. There are going to be stories about corruption or scandal, about you know, all sorts of things. That, that, but I, I, I am not going to expect, after finishing The Guardian, that I'm going to you know, open my window and smell tires burning in the streets. We're, you know, we're, we're, I'm not going to believe that, um, you know, however much we may dislike Boris Johnson's government, that it's you know, on the brink of civil war or anything like that. Uh, the same cannot be said, though, if I only read the six or seven stories in that same newspaper about China, where they are going to be only, you know, relentlessly negative. If I'm somebody who doesn't have experience of China, except through the pages of The Guardian, uh, I, I might form a picture that is pretty unremittingly negative. Uh, just, uh, 
and I, I, I don't have the lived experience of having been in China to balance that out. You know, this is a problem, but it's not because, uh, I mean, look, they're not going to write about the bridges that don't collapse. They're not going to write about, you know, the, the official who wasn't corrupt. Uh, they're, they're not going to write about, you know, about the days where pollution isn't so bad in, in Lanzhou or, or something. It's just, you know, we have to have a, an understanding of how media works. Look, most of us in the world, even those of us who are pretty dedicated China watchers, we still get a huge proportion of our information about China through English language reporting. And in all the world, the people who are writing about China on a you know, daily or weekly basis number in the mere low hundreds. There are not many of them. Together, they form a kind of lens. That lens has optical properties, right? If we understand how that lens diffuses and diffracts, how it distorts, we can adjust for it. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're a spear fisherman and you're, you're standing over a clear stream and there's a big fat salmon in the water there and you want to spear it. If you're a smart spear fisherman, you know that that fish is not where it appears to be. If you aim at just what you're, you're looking at, you're going to miss. But if you take into account where the sun is and where, where the light source is and where the fish appears to be, and you adjust for that, you, you're going to end up with a fat, juicy salmon on the end of your spear <laughs> and a full belly. And lots of EP3 fish oil. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids, right? <laughs> yeah, that is, that's very amazing. Thank you for that advice. Um, <laughs> and how would you say this the experience of reporting and being a journalist in China has changed them? Because you mentioned that there are journalistic traditions still in place and, you know, there are structural elements, but how has it changed if it has? Yeah, I mean, it, it's changed. I, 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 it's, it's hard to, to make real generalizations. I think for the most part, um, the, the level of depth and understanding of the journalists has gone up and up. The, the level of, of their Chinese language ability, their ability to conduct interviews uh, and do first person um, and, and, and primary source reporting has gone up. Um, but I think also uh, the, the appetite for uh, really negative stories on the parts of their editors has also gone up. So it's kind of a wash. I, I, I don't feel like there's, I, I would say that it's gotten noticeably say better or worse. Uh, a lot of it is just driven by American domestic politics or British domestic politics or what have you. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, Isla, I'm not sure how much time we have left if you want to go on to I see the so many questions. questions in the Q&A. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, can we hit some of those? Maybe, maybe it'd be helpful for the people watching. <laughs> Definitely. Um, should we start with the one right at the top? which is the, when you're examining issues that are incredibly sensitive and politically charged, like the Uyghur situation, for example, how do you reconcile the propaganda with an agenda that comes from both sides? The Chinese government, that has clear incentives to cover up their misdeeds, but have also been taught by um, Chinese immigrant parents that the West has always had their own ulterior mot motives in smearing China too. Um, yeah. So how do you get to the truth in that? That's, that's a really, really, really difficult one. Uh, look, um, you know, I, I think that, that, that there, this isn't something I'm, I'm going to be able to answer just in, in, in five minutes here. Uh, mm. You know, you, you need to be skeptical, uh, all, always, um, certainly skeptical of, I mean, because as, as, as Angela has pointed out, there's, you know, clear motivations. Uh, there are people of course, uh, outside of China, who, who do uh, want to cast Chinese atrocities in the worst possible light. So, you know, we all end up repeating certain numbers, uh, but very few of us can probably tell you exactly how those numbers were arrived at. Uh, I have looked into it pretty significantly, and I, I do have uh, certain reservations about, you know, the, some of the higher end range of the numbers that are often bandied about. Um, I uh, but but at the same time, we, we've got to be really, 
I mean, I, I, okay, you, 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 neither can you sort of blithely say, well, the truth must be something in between. That's not always the case either. Uh, it, it's like looking at any, any uh, sort of scientific evidence. Uh, you, you, you have to, we all end up making uh, decisions about our, look, very few of us have looked into the actual climate science. But when we see that the overwhelming preponderance of scientists who work on climatology, who work on, on atmospheric science, who work on, on ecology, oh, and they are all uh, in such tight agreement, we accept that uh, the, the truth of anthropogenic global warming, right? Mm. Um, so too with Xinjiang right now, I think that uh, when so many of the, 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 the people who truly are experts on this and don't have a dog in the fight, when they uh, all agree that there is a, a pretty serious violation of human rights, that at the very least we're talking about hundreds of thousands of individuals who are, have been extra legally, you know, extra judicially uh, detained and kept in, in camps, we, we, we probably have to accept the truth of that. We do have to accept the truth of that. Uh, and especially when so many of the people who are in the, the denial camp are such obvious whack jobs uh, with, with really clear agendas. Uh, now, I have a lot of trouble with some of the, you know, the, 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 the more uh, really scurrilous details that have come out. Um, and so some of those are more thinly sourced. When the only source for something is something like Radio Free Asia, uh, I would tend to be skeptical. But when it's been looked at by more reputable news organizations, if the AP, Reuters, the, 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 the Washington Post and the New York Times all also have this, I'm going to start taking it more seriously. But click on those links. See if, if the, um, the references are circular, as they often are. You know, they'll refer to, to some study that refers to some study, which refers you back to that original study. I mean, it, it, then, then that becomes kind of dangerous. Uh, that's a tough question. Mm. Thank you, though. I think that was very insightful, like and quite a quick way for us to really further educate ourselves. And again, this cycle of sources is a really, really good point. Um, so to go on to the next question, how did you find financial stability working freelance? And then I guess to add on to that, how did you decide between your freelance work and then movement into Baidu? Like what would you advise young people to look at in terms of Yeah, So there were a couple of steps in between in the case of my career. I was freelance for a few years from about 2003 to about 2005, mm -hmm. only for a few years there um, where I was truly living on freelance writing. And it takes a lot of hustle. I mean, you need to be pitching stories. Uh, you work more hours than you would if you were working a 40 hour week job. I and mean, because it, you know, when, it, when it comes right down to it, what you get paid for a freelance piece, you know, even if you're, you're paid $1,000, if that works out to you know, the number of hours you've spent, if you've spent you know, 50 hours on that, then already it's just, just certainly, it's not really worth it. And to do a good reported piece, often 50 hours is just the bare minimum. Uh, but all, more often than not, you're paid, you know, a pittance, you're paid, you know, $300 for a piece or something like that. Um, so it's very hard. You have to hustle and uh, often you have to, uh, to, you know, repurpose. Now, I didn't, I mean, if, if I had only made money as a freelance writer, only off of my journalistic work, I would have starved. There's just no way I could have done that. Uh, what I was doing was I had, you know, lucrative little gigs on the side, uh, just doing public speaking, for example. But uh, most importantly, like doing things like subtitling Chinese films. You learn sort of when the deadlines are for submission to Cannes or to other major film festivals. And you expect your phone is going to start ringing with these directors who are desperate to, to meet their deadline to submit and realize that relying on their friend who, you know, graduated from Beiwai to, to do the subtitling uh, when all of their American friends said, this is terrible. Uh, they, they have to scramble at the last minute and suddenly they're willing to pay you, you know, 30,000 RMB to, to subtitle a 90 minute film. And that's, that's when you make the money. <laughs> so yeah, it's, 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 it's a miserable existence. I don't envy anyone who freelances. And the worst thing right now is in China, it's actually dangerous to do it. It was always, you know, it was never smiled upon, you know, uh, but if you're publishing under your own name in China, the stakes are higher now. I, I don't, I don't recommend it. 
Okay. Um, I think that's, that's very interesting because I, I think especially now, like the opportunity of freelancing can seem quite appealing from, I guess, the movement and the fact that then it allows you to travel a bit more and go to different countries. But I've never looked into the market in China. So that's a really, really interesting advice. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. yeah. So the next question um, focuses more on how do you deal with um, the aspects of North American man mentality uh, that you might find hard to deal with? Um, uh, talking about how uh, they've studied in the US for a while, they're Eurasian born in Russia and now living in Canada, and the massive difference in people's mindset mentality uh, compared yeah, to Asian. Of Xi I, I also am a fan of Xi Xiao. We're old friends, we've known each other forever. Great guy. Um, uh, we used to play a lot of shows together back in the late 90s and early 2000s. But, um, uh, yeah, so uh, Lim, um, you know, the. the, the I, I guess I mean I'm I'm kind of inured to it right right now. Um, it, it maybe even it, it's it's I was prepared for it. I mean I grew up in the states and sort of I, I've always known how parochial and, and quite provincial Americans can be, North Americans can be, and um, you know they're 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 downright insular a lot. Uh, and I also sort of was prepared for the, just this sort of reaction. You know, China rising in the world it was going to, uh, you know, to create a, a particular psychological response that we're seeing playing out right now. And I, I've, I've just written along with a, an intern of mine an op-ed piece that'll be published in the next few days um, that looks at, at this reaction and compares it to the reaction of, of, of white conservative Americans uh, to the Black Lives Matter movement, to the, the real push for racial equality that we're finally seeing in the United States and how we're seeing this sort of spasm, this paroxysm of, of anger, of violence, uh, at this, this feeling of uh, loss of privilege and position. And we're seeing the same thing happening on a global scale. So, you know, American fragility is, 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 I mean, white fragility in America is just American fragility in microcosm, right? Uh, I, I think that that's that's clearly the case. And and once you you realize that, uh, and that that there's sort of historical forces behind it, it's maybe you realize it isn't worth your time to argue with every you know asshole who who comes along and gets in your face. Right. Eighth language. He's, Mandarin Chinese is his eighth language. That's just insane. What a! Uh, there are some people who were just you know, born with that talent. Congratulations! Mm -hmm. I was actually about to add to that as well. Well done! That's incredible. <laughs> well done! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely amazing. So I know that we are getting quite close to the end now. Kaiser, do you have time for one last question? Yeah, absolutely. Happy, to, happy to. Um, so the next question we have is: Do you expect that the decline in U.S.-China relations will limit work and journalistic opportunities at smaller publications in China? Do you think journalism in China entails greater risks today than previously? Um, yeah, and unfortunately, I think that there is there is a uh, this downturn is going to yeah it's going to make it difficult. As as a lot of you know, uh, Americans have already been tossed out, uh, and yeah, writing for publications in China is going to be uh, trickier, I think, going forward. There are, you know, tighter visa restrictions. Uh, there's this whole now layer of sort of COVID-19 uh, defensiveness that they're more likely to show up and knock on your door and ask for your papers now uh, and to look into your sources of income and things like that. So it's going to be hard. Uh, it's tragic. It's, it's again, it's, 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 a, it's a terrible tragedy of this downturn in the U.S.-China relationship, which I I should not hesitate to to add. I think uh, while you know China shoulders some of the blame for this, the preponderance of this has come from this this goddamn Trump administration. I mean, there it's this it's this crazy you know eleventh hour full court press to try to just you know scorch the earth. It's uh, I think Beijing has been admirably restrained in its response so far to this. I, I see another question here that I, I, I would like to actually answer, which I think is somebody who's an anonymous attendee who asked something I think is pretty smart. 
asks, do you, you think there's a bit of a contradiction or a paradox where the people who loudly proclaim that they know everything about China are the ones who promote themselves and those who genuinely have that empathy are more aware of what they don't know and may feel more cautious in putting themselves out there. Um, th that's absolutely spot on. Uh, it's, and it's so depressing that the, the loud mouth self-proclaimed China experts lack what I think is the, 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 the number one skill, I think, or the one trait that you need before you begin, which is humility. I mean, anyone who describes him or herself as a China expert is lying. There's no such thing. There's no America expert, right? Do you guys in the UK have America experts? I certainly hope not. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's dangerously hubristic. Uh, to think of yourself as a China expert. I certainly do not. I think, um, you know, a specialist, that's a, maybe a more modest term you could use. People don't like the word China watcher these days for whatever reason, but I think that has at least the, the, uh, a, a little bit of modesty to it. I think humility is, is a really important uh, characteristic. But, you know, humility... It, it gives you an appreciation for, for, for certainly for just the vastness of, of China's history or, or knowing anything about, you know, the, the, you know, infinite number of moving targets that are, you know, China in its contemporary, I mean, it, contemporary China in its politics and its economics and its sociology. Uh, but it, it, it can also be a source of, I think, um, of inspiration. I think it certainly was for me in my own career. I, I came back from China after 1989, uh, having been just sort of a goofy witness to a lot of the, what was happening. And I realized that there was this whole other language being spoken, a language that was symbolic, that was referential, that had a lot of references to uh, Chinese historical events or personages, things that I didn't understand. That whole language, it was, I, I've likened it to watching Peking Opera and not knowing that that general with all those banners on his back is supposed to be leading an army or that, that general who's holding this, you know, three foot long uh, staff with tassels on it is meant to be riding a horse. Not understanding all the references, I realized that I was missing, I, I knew nothing about what had actually transpired except at the most superficial level. And so that prompted me to undertake much deeper study and to get into the semiotics of, of protest that I'd seen. And I, I feel like I was just really rewarded for that. And it all started from a recognition of my own uh, limits, my own ignorance. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, one final recommendation request. Sure. Um, there's someone uh, called Tom has rec asks if he can recommend some well-written Chinese language materials um, to help understand the points of view coming out of China and also generally any recommendations on places, companies in China that might help students graduate and looking to build careers in China. A general recommendations list. <laughs> Oh, uh, gosh. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I mean, if you want to sort of get a finger on the pulse of, of so there's, of course, many strata of Chinese society. There's no one publication uh, that will reliably tell you, you know, here are what, here's what the 1.4 billion Chinese people are thinking. Uh, um, but I would, if, it, it depends on what you're interested in. If you really are, are, are keen on uh, getting a handle on, uh, sort of elite opinion on, on, on understanding what sort of more establishment intellectuals uh, are, are thinking and, and, and reading. And your Chinese level isn't up for reading primary source material. Uh, David Ownby uh, publishes this, uh, a, a, I guess it's a, a blog of translation of, of a lot of this stuff. It's called Reading the Chinese Dream. Uh, and check that out. It's fantastic. Um, he you can go back in the archives uh, if you want. Again, if you if you're, um, I, I really like a, a, a great uh, website that's put out by this fantastically talented Dutch woman uh, who. who uh, it's it's called What's on Weibo. It's just What's on Weibo dot com, uh, and it's it's just it's just terrific. It's just terrific. 
Um, what else would I, well, I mean, you know, SubChina is a, a pretty good source for a lot of that stuff. And we always link to original Chinese language source materials. If your Chinese is better and you want to read stuff, um, you know, official stuff, read Choshu, uh, you know, re actually read the People's Daily. It's, it's actually quite useful. Uh, and yeah, I, I guess there's terrific podcasts in Chinese. I think Gusher FM is a really great one if you're not listening to that already. Um, there's a million interesting YouTube channels uh, that, that, that you could, I, I could point to. I, I mean, nothing comes to me off the top of my head, but you know, it, it's out there. There's a lot of it. And this is a good suggestion because maybe we should curate something like this and put it on SubChina. Yes, yeah, that'd, be, um, that'd be great. If, yeah, yeah. if there's any that really come to mind, Kaiser, afterwards, please do send them sure, to us and we'll sure. put them in a blog on the website happily. so that people can check it out later. Happily, happily. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. It's been amazing. It's been so interesting hearing about all of the different roles you've done and all of your different insights on China. It's really exciting. It's making me really want to be back there. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't wait. I'm just champing at the bit right now to get back <laughs> just waiting <laughs> oh yes um so i think anna and i will stay here for another five minutes just in case anyone has any edu venture society university specific questions um again i'm from x university anna is from bristol but i can give you some information on setting up your own society at university if it hasn't got one yet or whether or not there's one being set up and you'd be able to, to join in september well thanks for having me it was a real pleasure and uh, I hope to uh, chat with you all again. Yes, please. Have Thank a you so evening. much. Okay. And also, if anyone has any China related questions, um, I can also help out. Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm also, I'm just at kaiser at subchina.com. If you have any uh, questions that I didn't get to, I'd be uh, happy, to, ha happy to talk to them. Anyone? Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> so much kaiser. Somebody asked, how much time do I spend reading every day? I try to spend four <laughs> hours. Wow, that is, that is good. That's right. impressive. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs> bye. Ooh. Just checking that no one's entered any more questions. I'm just seeing a few few messages on the chat. Someone asked, what does it mean to be a sub-China rep? So I'm a sub-China ambassador. And basically what you get is, um, well, you represent sub-China at university. Um, I'm a complete newbie, so I've just started. Um, but I'll be starting it in September this year. And you just, the best thing about it for me is that you're completely involved in it. So you can meet other sub-China ambassadors. You can meet a bunch of people involved. You can also contribute. It's difficult to but you can contribute to it you get free all types of newsletters there is a free weekly newsletter for anyone that wants it but if you're involved as well you get all the perks of it and um yeah then you, you will help kind of spread the word of sub china of what it's like to share news on china when it comes from the us and giving it more of like a an array of opinions rather than just so kind of filtered through the main media that we get uh, mainly social media um so yeah so if you're interested at all um i'm sure you can find me somewhere or message or email edgeventure and you can get in contact <laughs> okay i think there's a question for both of us could you tell us more about your backgrounds regarding China and how to get involved with your respective organizations? So if you want to go first, Isla. Yes, so I got involved with China when I got to university and knew I wanted to do an Asian language or to try and get involved in more of the Asian cultural sphere because it just really excited me. I had lots of Asian friends and I love, you know, the food. <laughs> um, and so in Freshers Week, I just got really lucky and signed up for a GoTico China program um, in China, which was very affordable because they do free and funded TEFL internships. So I knew that coming from like quite a low income family, I was still going to be able to go to China, which had always seemed so far away and so difficult to achieve. 
Um, so I managed to do that. I went out for two months. I did a mixture of summer camps in Shanghai, Beijing and Hong Kong. So got to really sort of see different aspects of the culture. And then I loved it so much. I applied to be a GoToCo campus ambassador this year, which Anna did as well. I saw her a little bit. <laughs> Which was really cool. Um, so we ran like uh, fairs and stuff. We go to co, encouraging people to apply and sharing experiences. And then I really wanted to work with uh, Richard and the team at Go to China because they were just so passionate and so sort of really inspiring with everything that they'd done to connect students here with China. So then we talked about EduVenture and the possibility of setting at us when we've been working on really trying to encourage more students to connect with China and connect with other countries and look for careers that are going to have a really positive impact, be that environmentally, socially, just through spreading awareness of world well the issues. So, yeah. Um, I'll talk a bit about my background mm -hmm. then as well. I also signed up to a go to go uh, camp, uh, which was amazing. And so I'm, I'm studying liberal arts at uni and I've been doing Mandarin along alongside it throughout the entire time. So obviously I've been very much like very curious about China. And so finding that opportunity was amazing. If you're studying a language, the best thing you can do is go to that place. Um, and then, yeah, same as Isla, I just kept getting in contact and we kept helping out, meeting people more and more. And then, uh, yes, and I'm going to also set up EduVenture at Bristol University um, and through EduVenture and I, I was able to meet Alex from SubChina and apply for that role because I do want to go into like hopefully a journalism career in the future. Um, so anything for the experience. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and um, we did have another journalism webinar as well, if anyone missed it and is really focused on journalism a couple of weeks ago. And all of our previous webinars are on the Go to Co China YouTube channel. So you can watch those at any time, just grab a cup of tea, have a little sit down. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll also be going back through all of the webinars we've done over summer and providing sort of short blog entries on the EduVenture website on the webinars with, you know, top tips, um, anything that was suggested in terms of like websites for jobs, reading material, um, top ways to network or connect with people or smaller companies. So we will really turn those into clear and quite easy to access resources for you lot so that you can quickly um, refer back to those, let's say if you're graduating in a year and you're not sure where to start yet. Um, but I would just say before we go that EduVenture is very much aimed at helping you achieve whatever it is that's going to have a positive global impact. So if you've listened to this webinar and you've thought like, I'm really excited, I definitely want to work in China, but maybe I don't want to do journalism, maybe I want to do something else. If there's an EduVenture Society on your campus or you want to create one, just go to the website and email us and we'll talk to you about it because we're really keen for all of our EduVenture sort of student members to really pursue what they want to do. And by doing so, share those resources and those possibilities with so many more students. And the networking possibilities already have been amazing. The number of people we've met, um, the number of students I've met just in the last like two months this summer who are so passionate about sustainability or, um, just like all of these different things that it's sometimes harder to meet them at your university because there's maybe a smaller pool of students in the sector that you want to go to like Anna was talking about journalism and then looking at journalism in China I think these are just such great opportunities to meet those other students who will then be hopefully you know they're out there with you in a few years time um so yeah I think that's everything so unless anyone has any last final questions they want to put in the chat um, or in the Q&A section, then I think we'll go. And everyone can have a great evening. It was lovely to yeah. host you all. So thank you so much for coming. Anna, it's been lovely hosting with you this week. You did a great job. Thank you job. so much. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. It was very fun. I've enjoyed mm. it.